In this set of videos, we will consider a new concept, the electric potential. Back in University Physics 1, we showed that we could solve, in theory, any problem involving a system of particles moving at speeds less than 10% of the speed of light by determining the net external force acting upon the system and applying Newton's laws. However, we found that many problems were difficult to solve by this method because either the individual forces acting upon the system were unknown, as in the case of collisions, or because of the vector nature of forces, which tended to make us want to try some other method, such as energy. Because of this fact, we used a lot of scalar concepts that worked, for instance, forces that depended upon space and were not constant, where the kinematic equations weren't true. Examples of scalar concepts were energy, work, and potential energy. They solved the problems in a more general way and made the math easier. In the same way, we're going to go back and consider energy methods and working with electric fields. Potential energy U. The first thing we want to do is to talk about the fact that you can define a potential energy as the negative of the work done by a conservative force as the object is moved from point A to point D. This is the definition of potential energy, and I'll now write it from back in Physics 1. The change in the potential energy, and only change in potential energy has meaning, is equal to minus the work by a conservative force, which is equal to minus the integral as the object moves from point A to point B of the conservative force dotted into the object's displacement. As I said before, the only the potential energy difference has any physical meaning. You can't talk about potential energy at a single point. When people say that the potential energy of a point is MGH, they mean with respect to some zero potential energy reference point. This is the reason we're going to find out in a little bit that voltmeters have two leads. One lead is the reference point, the second lead measuring the change in potential. That is, it's the two leads represent one of them, A, the initial point where we start the integral, the second, B, where we get the final position. Now, in gravitational potential energy near the planet Earth, we knew what the nature of the force was, and we were able to actually plug that into this integral. And when we did that, what we came up with was the following, that the change in potential energy was equal to mg times y, or h, for height. Now, Gravitational potential energy is not what we call a scalar field. The reason is, is that it depends on more than just the single place in where you're located in space. It depends upon this value of m. And even if you choose a zero potential reference point, such as this is u of h minus u at y equals zero, and you call this location your zero reference point, you still have this dependence on m. So it doesn't just depend on the positions of the object, it also depends on which object you put there. Potential energy, in other words, is a property of a system of objects. It's really not right to say the ball held at a distance h has a certain potential energy. If you were to destroy the Earth, there'd be no potential energy at all. It is the ball and the Earth system that has this energy stored. Now, if you want to convert this to a scalar field, you need to make this so it depends only upon the object's location. We can do this. How we do this is as follows. We take the potential energy function that we have, u, and we divide that by m. And when we do that, we get G and H. This is a field. It only depends upon the object's location and the strength of the field G. If you tell me a new location, I can tell you the value of U over M. I could not have done this back 
in our original thing because had you told me you were located, for instance, at y equal 3 meters above the Earth, I need to know what the object. Are we talking about a bowling ball? Are we talking about a baseball? If I divide out the mass, then I get an object that depends only upon the field and, of course, g, meaning the Earth. With this new function, gh, we can easily determine the potential energy. All we have to do is to find this new field and multiply by n. Now this may seem like a complete waste of time back in dealing with problems involving gravity, but this is exactly the principle upon which this idea of electric potential is. We're going to find a quantity that only depends on space and which is scalar. We're going to call that electrical potential or voltage. Once we find that, we can multiply by the charge of the object we place at that point in space and then calculate its potential energy due to the electric field. Now, I said that at a point in space. I always mean that that's potential energy with respect to a reference force. That is voltage with respect to a reference force. We have to define the reference point in order to it because only changes and potential energy actually have meaning. Now let's show this by applying this to the electric potential. In the case of electric fields, we know that if they are non-time variant, that is if they're electrostatic fields like we're dealing with at the first part of this course, the electric field is a conservative force. You can't define potential energies for things that are not conservative forces. We also know exactly how to define the potential energy. The potential energy is negative of the work done by this electric force, which means it's minus the integral from some initial point to some final point times the force dotted into the displacement. But we have a formula for the force. It's from the initial final, we put in QE, the charge times the electric field, and then we integrate that after we dot it into its displacement. This quantity here, this potential energy again, is not a scalar field. It depends upon the charge Q of the test object. So we can't talk about what's the potential energy at this point because it depends on what charge you put at that point. We need to get rid of this Q dependence, and what we're going to do is the same thing we did with gravity. We're going to take the potential energy and we're going to divide out the property of the object, which is the charge in this case. So we're going to get a new quantity. This new quantity I'm going to give a new symbol. I'm going to call it delta V and call it the electrical potential rather than the electrical potential energy. It is the electrical potential energy delta U divided by the charge on the test of the object. If I use my formula above and divide out the Q, I get it's minus the integral from A to B of the electric field dotted into the displacement. In other words, another way of saying it, it's, it's minus the work by E field divided by the charge on object. As such, you don't have to know anything about the object. You can calculate this integral one time at a particular path, multiply by the charge that you're going to move across that path and find the change in the potential energy. Or if you don't take the negative, you can calculate the work the electric field did on that object. If you want to change the charge, then you don't have to redo this integral to find the change in the work. You simply multiply by a new Q. Now the units of this thing are not the units of energy. They are the units of energy per charge. Or put another way, 
They are the units of joules per coulomb. We give this a new name, named after the person who did a lot about Alexander Volta, and it is called volts. Now, let's see what we've done. We found a new quantity, a new type of field, but it's not a vector field like the electric field was. It's a scalar quantity. Both of them only depend on the point in space and not upon the test charge that you're going to put at that point in space. But there's a big advantage in working with scalars rather than working with vectors. The electric field is defined in terms of the force. The electric potential is defined in terms of the work done as you move from a reference point to, in fact, a final point. So it is only change that has meaning. For point charges, we'll choose this reference point at infinity. That's because it simplifies the way the math and the formula looks. But we could have arbitrarily chosen any point location that we wanted for our reference point. All right, I'll continue this lecture on electric potential in the next video.